join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello and welcome to Forum IAS. Today is 16th May 2023 and these are all the articles that we are going to discuss today from prelims point of view. Let's go to the first article of the day. It is about Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act. What will be the features of this act and what are the requirements that this particular act imposes on workplaces? We will see about this. So basically here in this article what are all the hurdles to this acts implementation and what are the Supreme Court's recent directions. These two are from means perspective. So we will not be going into depth with respect to these things. We will see the prelims relevant part of this article. So. Why this article has come in the news because 10 years have passed after the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act came into force in 2013. Now 10 years has passed since the posh act came into force. So how did this posh act get formed? It was because of the gang rape of a social worker who was working with the Rajasthan government. Her name was Bhavari Devi and because of the plight she suffered, the court took cognizance of the matter and the Vishaka guidelines were issued. So basically in this regard, the court said that there is an absence of a law with respect to prevention of sexual harassment at workplace and they said that gender equality is a basic human right and in order to bring about this basic human right of gender equality the supreme court gave certain guidelines which were christened as the vishakha guidelines and later the posh act came into force so what is the posh act what are the definitions inside this posh act so this part is very important for prelims so this act defines sexual harassment in very broad terms that is it says that unwelcome acts such as physical contact and sexual advances a demand or request for sexual favors making sexually colored remarks showing pornography and other unwelcome physical verbal or non-verbal conduct of a sexual nature so it not only includes physical contact, it also includes verbal and non-verbal conduct also. Even if someone makes dirty signs, to say it in a crude language, it is considered as sexual harassment. So the law has given a very comprehensive definition of what is sexual harassment at the workplace. Then it defines who are all the employees. So. Companies Act, we have the Companies Act which says who are the employees but for the purpose of this act the definition is very very comprehensive. All women employees, it is only for women whether they are employed regularly, temporarily, contractually, on an ad hoc or daily wage basis, apprentice, intern, even employed without the knowledge of the principal employer all these people can seek redressal from this particular act. So again for employees also a comprehensive definition has been given. And what is a workplace under this act? Something that is even beyond traditional offices. It does include traditional offices but it does not restrict itself to traditional offices. It includes all kinds of organizations across sectors and even non-traditional workplaces like say for example an actress who was working in the cinema industry she doesn't have a fixed workplace a shooting spot can also be considered a workplace in this regard so again 
with respect to what amounts as sexual harassment who is considered as an employee what is considered as a workplace all these things are very comprehensively defined in the law so that there is no omission and this law applies to all public and private sector organizations throughout india so this act mandates some requirements on the employers what are those requirements that is if a company has more than 10 employees they have to constitute an internal complaints committee that is abbreviated as icc and this icc it has to be headed by a woman and in that committee there should be at least two women employees another employee and a third party so they will give much required um this person is a third party so there will be no favoritism right favoritism will not be there so this third party can have a very unbiased look at the complaint that is received so there is a third party that is an ngo worker and they must also have 5 years of experience and they should be familiar with the challenges of sexual harassment aisa nahi hai ki we have uh, put in any ngo worker they should have some kind of familiarity with the challenges of sexual harassment and uh, what about those companies where the number of employees are less than 10 because in india it is an informal economy formalization is very less so in that case also this particular act has a provision that is every district should have a local committee to receive complaints from women working in firms less than 10 employees and also from informal sectors including domestic workers home based workers so say a person is working for a company on a contract basis or they are working from home then also they are covered voluntary government social workers like people like bhavani devi or um, in modern day context asha workers even they are covered so for formal organizations they have an internal complaints committee and for informal there is a district local committee that has to be constituted by the district magistrate so these are all the provisions of posh act and this is very important for prelims next what are the gaps in the aadhar enabled payment system transaction model so we will be discussing this article why this article has come in news because of this youtuber pushpendra singh he made a he made a twitter thread explaining how his mother was scammed so a lot of similar scams are happening these days through the aadhar enabled payment system they are exploiting this particular system and scammers are emptying the bank accounts of the victims so in this regard we have to understand what is this aadhar enabled payment system here we have a uh, representative figure so what happens is this aadhar pay it is uh, typically administered by banking agents that is who facilitate doorstep banking so what happens is this banking agent say he goes to a village and somebody wants to make payment they might not have net banking so they need something that is accessible and understandable so first the aadhar number is entered and with this device a fingerprint sensor is attached once the fingerprint is scanned and verified transactions can be made through this system so you can check your balance see here uh, debited for so and so amount so uh, big, through this aadhar enabled payment system you can check balance you can transfer money etc 
so it is very convenient for those who don't have digital access simply speaking this device the banking agent's device has a attached fingerprint sensor without any need for otp the fingerprint is scanned and it is matched with the aadhar database obviously the bank account is connected with the aadhar card and so a verification takes place and the person's identity is authenticated after that whatever transaction needs to be done that is done okay so this is about aeps now we will say what the article says so cyber criminals are now using silicon thumbs to operate biometric point of sale devices pos means point of sale devices and biometric atm so they are using the silicon thumbs to fake this particular biometric identity and they are using this to drain the user bank accounts so what is aeps we already saw now it says that the aadhar enabled payment system is a bank led model which allows online financial transactions at pos that is point of sale devices and micro atms of any bank using aadhar authentication so there is no need for otps and it just uses the bank name aadhar number and fingerprint to make transfers we already saw right this can be a mobile phone linked to a fingerprint sensor or it can be a point of sale device also so you don't need any otps just with the fingerprint the transaction is facilitated by the banks so if these people are using fake silicon thumbs to drain the accounts then they must have access to the aadhar data right only then they can do these things so what they are doing is that aadhar numbers are readily available in the form of photocopies soft copies and criminals are using this aadhar enabled payment system to breach user information so anyway we go to take a photocopy of our aadhar card for even for our exams uh, the computer center you might send your data through telegram or mail to take print out so that way people get hold of the aadhar photocopies or soft copies and through that scam takes place so how do we protect ourselves in this context that is you can lock your aadhar information by visiting the uidai website so that even if your information is compromised they can't initiate any financial transactions because you have locked this aadhar data not only from exam point of view from practical life point of view this is very important i hope you will lock your aadhar detail and your parents aadhar detail after completing this video okay so what can be done in this case if at all you did all these things and you are getting affected unfortunately then you have to report it to the bank within 3 working days because rbi says that a customer's entitlement to zero liability arises when they are notifying the bank within 3 days then whatever money you lost it will be reversed back to you otherwise the bank is not liable and this 3 day limit is there so you have to be careful so if not for exam these two information these two pieces of information are important for practical life so keep an eye on this information okay next article is about the forest rights act so there was a two day convention on forest rights act in delhi so in that the activists discussed about the status of implementation and of this act and they condemned the state governments and the central government over the failure to implement the forest right act and they also spoke of the deteriorating forest rights so recognizing of individual forest rights is of paramount importance and in order to make the government give effect to this law these activists are planning to 
स्टेज प्रोटेस्ट सो इन दिस आर्टिकल वॉट वी नीड टू कॉन्सेंट्रेट ऑन फ्रॉम प्रिलिम्स पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इज अबाउट द फॉरेस्ट राइट्स एक्ट विच वी विल सी नाउ ओके सो द फॉरेस्ट राइट्स एक्ट इट रेकग्नाइज एंड वेस्ट द फॉरेस्ट राइट्स एंड ऑक्यूपेशन इन फॉरेस्ट लैंड इन फॉरेस्ट ड्वेलिंग स्केड्यूल ट्राइब्स एंड अदर ट्रेडिशनल फॉरेस्ट ड्वेलर्स सो बेसिकली इट विल रेकग्नाइज द फॉरेस्ट राइट्स एंड ऑक्यूपेशन ऑफ फॉरेस्ट राइट्स फॉर द स्केड्यूल ट्राइब्स एंड अदर ट्रेडिशनल फॉरेस्ट ड्वेलर्स ओके now what are the four types of rights in this particular act there is title right so these scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers they have the right to ownership to land farmed by tri tribals and maximum they can have their title on 4 hectares of land that is the maximum if they are farming on the forest land say they are doing shifting cultivation the forest dwellers or the tribes can be given the title deed that is the patta right but it is subject to a limitation of 4 hectares okay so it's not like new lands will be uh, allocated only those which are actually being cultivated by the concerned family for them only the title will be given and not for any random piece of land this is for forest conservation then second right is the use right that is the forest dwellers and scheduled tribes they can collect minor forest produce they can have access to grazing areas they can have access to pastoralist routes so they can collect only minor forest produce like tendu leaves guar gum etc so these are all minor forest produce then third one is relief and development rights that is if there is any forced displacement then they have the right to rehabilitation that is another right and lastly they have forest management rights that is they have the right to protect regenerate conserve or manage any community forest reserve which they have been traditionally protecting there are these um, sacred grooves you must have heard of this sacred grooves in many parts of india these are all very perfect example of community forest resource and the tribals have specific conservation practices with respect to sacred grooves and they will be allowed to carry these out so what are all the rights given the tribes are given title they have the right to use the forest land for minor forest produce they have the right to rehabilitation and they have the right to conserve community forest resource these are all the four rights okay so how to claim these rights that is it can be claimed by any member or community who has for at least 3 generations prior to notification of this act primarily resided in forest land so who is the authority to initiate the process the gram sabha is the authority to initiate the process and they will grant this particular license and it can be given to scheduled tribes as well as other traditional forest dwellers they will say the gram sabha will say yes this claim is right and they can be given title that authentication is provided by the gram sabha okay so this forest rights about this questions have been asked in upsc prelims so this is very very important and study this forest rights with some sincerity okay next article is about one stop centers for zero waste to be launched in cities so it is a step towards cutting waste generation the government will launch one stop centers in this one stop centers citizens can go and deposit their old clothes shoes books toys plastic anything that can be reused or recycled so this is following the rrr route that is reduce reuse and recycle 
ओके सो दीज पर्टिक्युलर आर्टिकल विच आर बीइंग डिपॉजिटेड इन द वन स्टॉप सेंटर दे विल बी रीफर्विश्ड एंड दे विल बी डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड टू डिसर्विंग पीपल so this particular one stop center is being carried out by the ministry of housing and urban poverty alleviation and this comes under the campaign meri life mera swachh shahar that is my life my clean city under the aegis of swachh bharat mission urban 2.0 so uh, for the past one or two months the swachh bharat mission urban version 2.0 it has been quite in news so we will see about the swachh bharat mission vision 2.0 okay so this particular swachh bharat mission urban they have three major objectives that is to achieve 100% open defecation free status that is odf status 100% scientific solid waste management and effecting behavioral change through jan andolan so this particular swachh bharat mission urban was launched on 2nd october 2019 so swachh bharat mission urban 2.0 what are all the components so they want to achieve a garbage free urban india now seeing this the one stop center we studied about makes sense so this one stop center makes sense now right so uh, more focus is required to be given to issues such as source segregation collection and transportation this is with respect to collection of garbage right so uh, it is to make the urban india garbage free and to sustain the odf status already if they have achieved the odf status it has to be sustained and slippage should be prevented then intensified focus on iec that is information education communication and behavior change so these are all the focus areas and this swachh bharat mission urban will be extended for 5 years from 1st october 2021 to 1st october 2026 so from prelims point of view what we need to remember is that there is a mission for garbage free urban india and 100% odf status solid waste management and behavior change through jan andolan and there are 5 years of program implementation so these are all the important aspects we need to remember for the exam last article is about wholesale price index okay so it says that the wpi shrank 0.9% in april on base effect base effect is the effect of the base year or if the base year that is base year or is the year based on which the data is converted to real terms okay so if something cost rupees 100 today and uh, in the next year this is 2023 in 2024 if the same thing cost 100 rupees it's not the same we have to compare it with the reference year so for example if we take 2011 to be the base year then the price is of 2011 is substituted so that these two can be comparable okay say for example in 2023 one plate of momos cost 100 rupees in 2024 um half a plate of momo cost 100 rupees but we need to compare this right to compare that we have to substitute the prices of 2011 so that these two data are comparable another thing is uh, say for example if um, the price again we'll take uh, the same example of momos 2022 2023 say for example uh, one plate of momo cost 100 rupees in 2022 and suddenly what happened the maida which, which uh, the momo is made it became very cheap and the cost of one plate of momo became 50 rupees so it's because of a low base effect 
that is it is an abnormal figure so what is base effect that is the effect of the base ear this is the base ear with which you are doing comparison the figure with which so i will erase this just a minute so what is this base effect is the effect of base figure with which we are comparing present data okay so if you didn't understand also just remember that it is the effect of base figure with which we are comparing the present data just understand this this statement is even self explanatory now what is more important for prelims is the wpi so it represent a basket of wholesale goods and in this only goods are counted not services in cpi both goods as well as services are counted but in wpi only goods are counted so it focuses on the price of goods that are traded between corporations that is why it is wholesale price it does not concentrate on goods purchased by the consumers wpi is published by office of economic advisor in the ministry of commerce and industry and what type of commodities are covered manufacturing inputs intermediate goods like minerals machinery basic metals etc and the base year for wpi is 2011 12 okay so this slide is singularly very important for prelims who publishes wpi what is the base year and all there is a probability of being asked and this base effect can also be asked now we will discuss some previous year question consider the following statements most of india's external debt is owed by governmental entities two all of india's external debt is denominated in us dollars which is correct see all of india's debt cannot be denominated in us dollars most of it is denominated in us dollars so this statement is wrong most of india's external debt is owed by governmental entities what does this mean does government owe most of external debt this is also wrong because external commercial borrowing external commercial borrowing so this borrowing is made by the corporations the companies from outside india that constitutes most of external debt and not government entities and they are asking which is correct so answer is d neither one nor two next question which of the following is not included in the assets of a commercial bank in india a advances b deposits c investments d money at call and short notice so deposits they are not assets deposit is a liability because if someone is keeping a deposit with a bank the bank is liable to pay interest and the bank also should pay back the principal amount so deposit is a liability it is not an asset so answer is b next question which one of the following suggested that the governor should be an eminent person from outside the state and should be a detached figure without intense political links or should not have taken part in politics in the recent past a first administrative reforms commission b rajamannar committee c sarkaria commission d national commission to review the working of the constitution the answer here is sarkaria commission they only gave some guidelines that governor should normally be a outsider and they should not be involved in intense political activity 
okay so that's it for today's discussion follow us on all these social media platforms this is indumati signing off thank you and all the best